and I'm a sweaty dude, brother. That's the first thing that we need to, to understand here. So basically, founder market fit. Talk me through that. How did you get things going? You fully bootstrapped? I started with very little money. You keep everything small. You have to ask for favors. Any interesting ways you guys are using AI? They don't believe in anything. They only believe in money. They're gonna sell it to anyone that's willing to pay. That's the thing about China. What is up, guys? Welcome back. We have two amazing guests with us for e-commerce live. We have Phoenix, who is going to give us a treasure trove of data. She's the CEO of AdBeacon. She's going to come on later today and just drop some gems on us. I'm excited for the gems. And then we got Jack, CEO of DuraDry. I have some right here with me because I'm a sweaty dude. I get nervous. I sweat a lot. So Jack's been helpful with that. Jack's going to talk about scaling DuraDry, basically everything to do with Shopify brands, scaling DuraDry, everything he's excited about. Um, I'm super, super excited. We're just going to get into it. Uh, Corey, do you want to take it away? Yeah, let's go. Thanks, Colin. And thanks, Jack and Phoenix. Yeah, I always like to start these things off. If you could just tell us a little bit about the, the genesis of DuraDry and how you came to found it and uh, what that was like. Like calling I'm a sweaty dude, brother. That's the first thing that we need to, to understand here. So basically founder market fit. But the genesis, honestly, you know, one of those random or, or things in life that you don't plan. I got into CPG, in the, the CPG world, maybe 20 years ago, back in Venezuela where I'm from, but started, you know, selling stuff to brick and mortar, hand soap, hand sanitizer, shaving gel, a bunch of other stuff from China, from Turkey, local manufacturing. And basically, you know, that's how I, I learned CPG, of course. You know, it's you keep learning. Moved to the U.S. and, and had that project back in Venezuela, and, just, and then when I came here, I started it from scratch again. No network, no no understanding of the market, no nothing. Just bootstrapping it, and here we are. Talk me through that. How did you get things going? You fully bootstrapped, or you? Like, how did you get to launch? I started with very little money, but it, I did start with money. When I say very little money, let's say under 100K to do our first run, you keep everything small. You have to ask for favors, not for people that you know, but for, for example, for manufacturers. Hey, you know, I know that the MOQ is, I don't know, 10,000 units, but I'm starting out. Just please help me with this. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of just hustling. Like I package every order myself. I went to the manufacturing facility to deliver some raw material. There was stuff going and coming from my home, um, a tiny studio apartment. That's how you do it. Another thing that is key is understanding that it takes time. Um, if you have no network and you don't have a lot of money and you can't raise money, because honestly, in my case, just even till today, I haven't been able to raise institutional money, right? But it takes time in the sense of if you take the low hanging fruit, you're going to be able to survive. You're not going to be able to scale like crazy, but the business is going to start moving. And once you start moving and you can start fixing things in the business, you're going to start growing little by little. And then you just reinvest anything that the business is making into the business, right? Until hopefully one day you cross that threshold of critical mass or you find institutional capital, or, you know, maybe you don't need to, maybe just keep growing bootstrapped, right? There's a bunch of brands that have done it. I think that Sean from Rich bootstrapped it and there are over 200 million a year now. What was the brand vision with DuraDry? What was the angle or differentiation points that you guys believed in for launching? We started as a solution for excessive underarm sweating. It's a sort of like a niche problem. And when I say niche is because maybe five to 10% of the population sweats or has a condition that makes them sweat more than they want. Let's say 5%, but then up to 20 sweats more than they want. And that's how we started. And of course that allows you to focus all your resources into one very specific angle. And once you kind of like conquer that angle, I mean, I, that's what, I, what I'm currently doing. You have to start broadening the appeal of the brand and, and start growing it, right? I don't know if it's just out of luck or if that's the way it happened because I planned it. Honestly, it's been so long, but basically, if I had tried to go straight into, you know, trying to compete face to face against any brand from Procter & Gamble or Unilever, probably I would have been left in the dust, right? Starting niche and then trying slowly by slowly to broaden the appeal. Were there aspects about like the product 
ingredients or something that were differentiated? Like, is it, you're saying it's, you know, antiperspirant kind of angle? Is that right? Or something that people does not understand is that there are many ingredients to help reduce sweat. Out of those many ingredients, um, only a few are approved by the FDA. Out of those that are approved by the FDA, there are some that are more effective than others. And out of those that are more effective than others, even some that have the same exact name on the label have different properties. Why? Because they modify the atomic ratio between the components of that molecule. Exactly, they're, they're isomers. They have the same inky name, but they perform differently, right? So there's so much to know about this antiperspirant industry, let's say. Um, and I've been focused on it for a long enough time to kind of like dig, dig, dig until I understood so many things uh, about the ingredients and also the excipients, which is what we're working on right now. So you guys are doing well, mid seven figures brand. Any channels for growth that you guys are excited about that you see as being instrumental to the future that people maybe should be looking at? None. And when I say none, that includes TikTok and that includes everything, every, everything at the moment for under let's say $50 AOV brands, it's it's kind of tough. And that's one of the reasons why for the last, I don't know, a year, a year and a half, I've been focusing a lot on product. They say that you do sales because you're bad at marketing and you do marketing because you're bad at product. So even though marketing is the one that pushes or helps you scale, the product has to be there. So I had to go back to the product and start working on it harder and harder and harder. Well, they say the best way to market your product is to sell it. Have you guys done anything with YouTube? Yes. Honestly, I love YouTube. But again, it's tricky for low UV products, but I love YouTube. It I think the hardest part about it is you can spend $50,000 on an ad and get zero results, or you can spend $5,000 on an ad and spend, you know, be able to spend millions of dollars on that ad and get you know, build your entire business on that. It's a hit or miss almost because if a creative is not quite right or the type of humor that you chose doesn't feel good to your target market, that's it. You just threw down the drain, I don't know, half a million dollars. This long form that you're talking about are agencies like, I think one is called Raindrop or something like that. They're very good, but you know, the price range is like between 300 and 500K for for a commercial. The second part is attribution that with, with YouTube is, is a little bit tricky because it's mostly a view through conversion. But yeah, I love YouTube. And by the way, the algorithm when compared to TikTok and, and IG, I like it much better, the YouTube the YouTube's algorithm. Yeah, it feels like if an agency could figure out how to produce you know that type of content for an affordable rate for 20K, like that would just be all day long. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You can spend millions on that one creative. That's the beauty of one of those. Until you've like reached audience saturation, you, you can grow to, to nine figures on one. That's what Pillowcube did basically, is they just had that one creative rolling and then they scaled it onto YouTube all the way to eight past nine figures and the fatigue never ran out, which is crazy. So any interesting ways you guys are using AI, trying to suss out interesting use cases. The first thing I would say, most things that, that say AI, it's bullshit. You have like, you have to kind of like, where's the AI, right? It's most, most of them is just, just a linear regression and that's what they do. Super, super excited for creating ads with video ads with AI. There, you know, one is stealth that I'm talking to. And then there is our cats that I don't know, a day or two ago, this girl from dirty something, the whites posted it and honestly, it's just, it blows my mind. In one year, we're going to have an issue with OnlyFans models, with influencers, with, you know, any anyone that's selling their likeness online. We're going to have an issue with this, with this uh, thing. To your question, honestly, pretty basic stuff like ChatGPT helps me a lot with, with creative copywriting and research. Uh, Firefly, free tool from Adobe, also great. But, you know, I would need to check you know, all the apps that we're using and where are the ones that are using AI. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of it. Half of it is BS, half of it is, is, is real. I would say 90% is BS. Hot, coming in hot, 90% is BS. I love that. Phoenix, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I don't love the direction AI is going in terms of creation of ads. Like I love the beauty of a brain. So maybe I'm a purist in that sense, but I will say that there are incredible benefits. Like mid journey is 
insane. I know that we are working with Gemini instead of ChatGPT, which is far more intuitive. It it actually like takes it, it stores what you prompt it much better, I would say. So I would go into that. We use it very consistently. I did my entire wedding itinerary on ChatGPT and then like gave it and did a better job than my wedding planner. When it comes to like ad creation, you're talking to somebody who loves UGC. You're talking to somebody who loves like out of box thinking. I just don't know if AI is going to be that big brain. I think it's going to be the execution arm in a lot of ways. So that's just my, my opinion on it. Yeah. As soon as you saturate the market with everything that looks the same, stuff that's going to stand out is going to be stuff that's different. And that's the problem with cookie cutter solutions. They're going to just not going to work. But these tools to enable, I mean, I think that's a great point. And going back to like YouTube, like what Sora, I'm sure you guys have seen OpenAI's new video model, like where video will be at to be able to construct your vision in a unique way. To your point of what you were discussing about, like what Raindrop does, Jacques at Raindrop and like a couple of those guys, they do incredible work. But I've also been on the other side. It wasn't actually them, I believe, but it was a different agency that had done for a telehealth company, this really mass produced video. And we had like a big star that was on there. They wanted to do Carmen Electra down the road. And they spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions for this ad, right? Highly produced. And it did not hit. It did not hit at all. But my, it was about erectile dysfunction. And it was like, it was a huge deal. We spent so much money on it. And then I spent a lot of money on ads for it. And again, it didn't hit. So then we did one on a phone, an iPhone. It was me. And I was like squirting toothpaste out of a bottle and it just wrecked house. And I guess the day and age of us taking so much risk in a highly produced piece of content is just that that risk factor is just too high in comparison to being able to, by ratio, just come out with a bunch of new content on an iPhone, hoping that it's a fraction of a hit from a well-produced ad. So it's a caveat to what you're saying. And like, I understand how impactful that type of commercial can be. But I, again, I want lifetime value here. <laughs> and I, it's just hard for me to dump all that capital there unless you have FU money, like you were saying, Corey, where you're like, just, just burn it and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Let's move forward to some, some tasty news. We got some amazing news for you guys. Just got some recent D2C news and then we're going to jump into a couple tweets. But um, first one of the day that hit this week is that the e-commerce deal count fell more than 50% in 2023. Super scary. What do you guys think about this? Is our e-commerce deals just going down the pipe and we're just like never going to be able to do acquisitions or are the numbers so thrown off? People are just going to be selling for crazy, crazy valuations that aren't good anymore. I think we're in a really weird time. You know, when people don't feel confident, people don't move. So it's like, I'll take it back to iOS because, you know, that's my nerdiness coming out is when iOS 14 came out and attribution and all the issues were happening. Nobody was coming out with solutions. No one was talking. People were talking about what iOS was, but they weren't coming up with solutions and nobody was moving. So they're scared. And I think that's what's happening right now. Retail is back out. You know, people are feeling confident to go back in stores. People's buying habits are different. It's a highly saturated market now in e-commerce. And there's a lot of trust issues too, because a lot of people got burned, you know, buying via e-commerce and D2C. Also valuations and the trajectory of what they were supposed to meet at weren't being met, especially in 2023. A lot of people were expecting to hit record-breaking numbers. Some did and many did not, especially in 2024. It's just an unstable time. So to me, this is nothing new, but I think the people who sustain and into the next year, we're going to see these numbers rise. This is my prediction. I agree with most of what Phoenix said. To be honest, I'm, I'm actually excited that this is happening. I know that there's people suffering because they, they're not being able to raise, but I think it's healthy for the industry because many VCs got burnt out because they invested at ridiculous valuations. E-commerce is not tech in the sense of, of how quickly you can scale it. You're moving atoms, right? There's inventory, there's lead times, there's manufacturing, there's a lot of stuff and you have to also iterate on the brand. It takes a lot of time. You can't just dump hundreds of millions of dollars into a brand and expect them to advance in one year what they need three or five years to do. I love it. Both optimistic takes on the industry of it as a whole. So you got basically the, the warriors surviving and moving forward despite all odds, and then a healthy correction for the overall industry. This is also just indicative of a bunch of really poorly run 
D2C brands that were well-funded. And I also believe that like we're on a comeback cycle. Like whenever you see mainstream media picking up on how bad things are, that's when things get interesting. And to, you know, now it's easier to build to your point, less money being thrown into ad bid markets so you can profitably grow. So yeah, I think we're actually in a big change cycle where everyone was forced to become way more efficient last year and drive towards profitability and the companies who survived and the ones that are able to get into the game are all going to be of like a higher caliber and enabled by a better tool set in the market. Sweet. Let's jump on to the second piece of news. Um, Allbird CEO, brand new, plans to close basically most of the stores and then Outdoor Voices closed all of its retail stores and then former employees from Outdoor Voices are saying it's going to be bankrupt any any second now, any minute now. What do you guys think about this? I mean, everybody always beats up on Allbirds as like this this company never should have gone public as the D2C company. And then you have Outdoor Voices who's pushing all back to e-commerce, two beasts in the industry. What do you guys think about these two? This is happening more than we even know because it hasn't been public yet. I have been working with the brand for over three years. It is extremely well known and i'm seeing that i saw that happening six months ago with this brand and they just completely cleaned house um they literally just cleaned house completely agency gone cf or ceo uh cmo gone like everything and they think somehow doing that is going to save the brand or they already know it's going to fold um, i think i'm going to use the example of the brand i'm speaking to rather than these two because i think it aligns very similarly is number one, this brand went into retail too fast at a time that didn't make sense. So about three years ago, they're like, we're going to go into retail and they opened like five to seven stores brick and mortar. And they were massively expanding because they had all this extra capital from when COVID hit via their D2C. So their projections, like we were just talking about, were just so inflated that they're expecting this big boom that's just non-existent but they never actually tapped into brand. And that's kind of what I wanted to tap onto with you, Corey, is like some of them were just not well run. Some were poorly run. They didn't think of the lifetime value. They didn't think about the long-term strategy and then like backup plans, profitability should have been first, but also like creating a brand that people wanted to come back to. And I don't know if all birds, outdoor voices may be a little bit different, have built that strong enough to, to withstand the massive growth that they've had, especially going public. So I think this is very normal, like not, I wouldn't say normal, but this is more common than we realize. And I'm seeing it directly. I mean, I was just let go from that brand of media buying last month and I had been working with them for three years and eight X their business since I started with them. I just have this hy hypothesis and I'm, you know, definitely curious to hear your thoughts on this too, Jack, but I feel like there was just massive wage and expense inflation in like 2018 through 22 and people just didn't correct. And at the end of the day, that looks like Twitter style layoffs and then rebuilding from there at reasonable wages with people that are motivated to to work in this new environment that is not, you know, the calm, relaxed, you know, everything, you know, snacks at the bar type lifestyle that they were accustomed to when these companies were overly funded. And there's a way to run, you know, if we look at, as we mentioned, the Ridge and how you guys are doing it, we got Haven on last week, like you can run these things scrappy and like build an amazing brand with amazing product, amazing service, but you have to work hard. You have to find people who are willing to work hard. You can't over hire. You have to think smart probably about offshore hiring for as many roles as you can. I agree with everything you both said. And I think that it's multifactorial. There's, you know, there were, there were a lot of supply chain issues during the pandemic and then everyone stocked up and then demand dropped. But I think a, a big part of it is that institutional money changed or pivoted so fast that they were only interested uh, in growth. If you were not growing like crazy, they wouldn't fund you. So the incentive for this uh, DTC companies was to just push for growth, even though they were losing money because the people that were funding them couldn't care less about the losses. They were just funding, funding, funding. And then suddenly 2022, maybe 2023, they pivoted, hey, we now need profitability. And then when you have a ship that's just, you know, big ship, let's say, because of the money that you, that you have, moving in a certain direction, it has momentum. And then just to steer it is very, very difficult. 
Let's run on to number three. This is my most fascinating piece of e-commerce news in the past couple of weeks. I'm super nerdy about this, but e-commerce giant Chewy is now opening physical spaces, but they're gonna be veterinary clinics and they're starting in Florida. They're gonna be called Chewy Vet Care. I think this is so unique. This is such a good take on conventional retail where every brand is like, oh yeah, let's just prop up a retail store. This is such a good spin on it. I think it's either gonna crush or it's gonna fail beautifully. There's no in-between for this. Uh, what do you guys think? I read the article and actually what caught my eye wasn't even that. I think that's super fascinating, but it's this concept. It's a software solution called Practice Hub. And Practice Hub is basically an e-commerce portal for vets. Um, so they don't have to hold excessive with the inventory and they can just ship it on their behalf, which to me is just so genius because again, like integrating a brand with that segment and category is amazing during covid we have a I'm, I'm in california specifically in thousand oaks and we have our mall right and the mall i started seeing all these shops close 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 so you do this giant piece of property and like nobody is actually like in the stores anymore and i was like okay we're gonna have to reinvent what a mall is like you come in here and maybe it's a virtual reality or you do a try on but then it gets shipped to your door you no longer can just go in and buy like the whole landscape has to change something has to change and it was really surprising that nothing changed we just waited for COVID to stop and then we just went back to retail and we didn't rethink it so i think merging e-commerce in some form and with retail could be a game changer right now we're really looking at them as completely different avenues for revenue when in reality they could go hand in hand so i think this is a very interesting approach i wonder if you can create a subscription model in store too or like have there's so many more things we can do i think this is just tapping or like scratching the surface i think there are many layers to this i love the idea first of all pet food is notoriously bulky so i guess there's a little a bit of that there you also have some branding because if you call the the vet the veterinarian clinics chewy there's also some branding component there you're also giving a face that's positive to the consumer because you know it's like care and then you go and grab your whatever you need for your for your pet i just i particularly think it's it's genius maybe they maybe the vet pays for the rent and then the sales just are extra revenue, uh, extra, like just pure profit, let's say. I don't know exactly how they're modeled this, but I, I do like it. Yeah, they're going beyond just integrating retail, right? They're integrating a service line that's associated with that customer, if you will, the, the pet. Um, I think the likelihood of success is very low. I think it's genius, but the execution, um, and I think the fact that they're looking at this to execute on growth, presumably, makes me question that they could also execute on building a high quality service operation. So I don't know enough about the brand, but it feels brilliant, but really hard. Well, sweet. Let's run to, we got two tweets for you. First one is from Sean. I brought this one up specifically because I had no clue about this. I didn't know what a general exclusion order was. I dove into this entire thread. I read all about this. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it is the nuclear weapon of IP enforcement. Basically, anyone who wants to even think about selling a Ridge wallet ever again will get absolutely destroyed if they try to do it in on Amazon, on Shopify, on anything. Now, mind you, this is really, really expensive. Sean explains, you know, we have a legal team of people that cost us over a million dollars a year. This is going to have to get signed by the president of the United States. Six of these get approved every single year. When you're thinking about IP stuff, six the whole year. You only get six, and Sean's one of them, which is absolutely crazy. It's beside the point. Yeah, what do you guys think about this? I didn't even know this was a thing. Jack, would you try to get one of these? And First of all, what, what's the mechanism? Because I have no idea what's the mechanism here. It's to prevent third-party sellers from... Are you seeing how is it enforced? Yeah, exactly, because the regular route is, hey, you catch someone, and then... I don't know how, but you just... You just demand that they remove it or... You can enforce with the retailers, right? Like you go to Amazon and say, no, you know, I have this general exclusion. Guessing that the six is how many people go through the trouble of it every year versus a limitation, uh, like a, a, a statutory that we only allow six new companies that'd be anti-competitive. Seems like a great opportunity for AI and the lawyer to build a service to make this easier on brands to go get this done, so. If you manufacture in China, that means that they have access to your IP. They're actually making the thing. 
they don't believe in anything. They only believe in money. They're going to sell it to anyone that's willing to pay. That's the thing about China. I was at the trade, uh, it was like one of the biggest trade shows in Guangzhou, China. So I used to go back and forth. There was the Hong Kong trade show and then you go to Guangzhou. So you'd go back and forth. It was like one, you know what I'm talking about, right? And I mean, yeah, it's a slime, it's slime city. It's profit city. It's, it's a completely different, it's, yes, I, I understand the idea of general exclusion order. I think it's a good, nice to have. I think it's a privilege to be able to get something like that when the majority cannot, with the understanding that the majority will replicate regardless and you just have to wait for the reprimand. That's the biggest problem is like, what's going to come of it? I think it's really important. I wish the system was different. I just don't know what the solution is when we do manufacture overseas and do business and knowing that you're in a lot of, uh, you're in a very vulnerable state regardless. Next up, we got David talking about, uh, this is the final one for you guys. It's crazy to me that Meta has been broken for a month now. Uh, is Meta broken or is this just the new norm? Maybe Phoenix can probably shed a ton more light onto this because she's got the, the juicy data. But um, it just feels like this might be the new norm that people don't really want to hear that. What do you guys think? Okay, look, Meta has been broken to me in my eyes for a very long time. So for me, I'm not, this isn't new to me, but I also think like bid caps, cost caps, a lot of the structures that we've had in place as bumpers to ensure that we have a lower CPA are just not going to be as valid anymore because of this expedition of spend randomly at times or whatever it may be. We're relying so much on a platform to make sure we get the best possible results. I think we need to reinvent and understand that the platform we've trusted so much is just a platform. It's just that. And I think to the point of David Herman, fantastic. So I was in Dubai uh, and I, the, we were doing affiliate world and I'm sitting here and I'm hearing the same redundant shit um, on stage, no shade to affiliate world. And then Mark Joyner comes up on stage. And Mark Joyner is the inventor of the Pixel. And he says something that I'll never forget. He's like, never create a table with three legs. You want a table with a thousand legs. And I didn't know what that meant at first, but what he meant was if you create a table with three legs, Meta, Google, TikTok, you're super vulnerable because a lot of those companies prior to iOS put all their eggs in Meta. <laughs> and then we did everything on Meta. So when Meta quote unquote breaks, our business breaks. So you want to create a table with a thousand legs, maybe not a thousand, right? That's a lot, but it's the same idea here. So you're too invested in meta period. I completely agree with, you need to be able to have a robust brand, organic channels, all these different things. I product development, like Jack said, that's what keeps people coming. Meta is just a tool to, you know, to increase it at a rapid rate. So that's my hot take. I think it's just, he's a hundred percent on on point here. I agree with Phoenix, but also to add to that, yes, you want to diversify your channels as much as you can. At the same time, you have limited bandwidth. So it's normal that, you know, most people focus on a few channels, um, especially to scale. There's also the fact that maybe 10, 20 years ago, I don't know if you guys remember, the only way was to be, let's say on TV, cable TV, and you had to spend millions, right? And then we got these new, new channels and it worked for us. But I think that what's happening now is that these channels are maturing and slowly by slowly, entry price is going up and up and up and up. And it's pricing us and a bunch of people out of the market in some way, right? So you're going to need product. You're going to need to diversify channels. You're going to need to have distribution. Because again, let's say that I'm competing for an ad placement on Google with Old Spice, right? So they are going to be able to outspend me, not only because they have more money, but they have more distribution. So their ads are going to probably are going to have better return investment if they do it right. So again, there are so many things happening. The trend is that ads are every year it's going up and up and up and up and up and it's pricing people out that's you know as simple as that and keep in mind like meta is still profitable like you can still make money off of it right and with timu or temu however you want to pronounce it it's like i always there's a saying right just be better be better <laughs> like just try to be better in other words if i'm seeing mcdonald's ads all day long and suddenly i randomly see a Taco Bell ad, I just because I get some variance there, I'm probably going to want to go to Taco Bell instead of being fed, you know, McDonald's all day long. But again, let's flip it. If it was a Taco Bell ad, but it was something so cool and it created silence in the sea of noise of McDonald's ads, it's going to catch my eye. It's like, 
again, you might not have the majority, but if you do have the minority and the chance that they do see you, make it count. So the, the days of mundane bullshit ads is gone, which I think is a big reason why so many companies folded. Amazing. Corey, you want to start the data corner with Phoenix? Yeah, let's, well, it, not much for me to say here. I'm just, Phoenix, why don't you just kick it off? Tell us a little bit about how you started Ad Beacon, and then if you can give us some insights and we can close it out. Yeah. So I actually started my, a little background on me. I started my entire career as a model um, back. And that's actually how I know Corey, just through the grapevine when he was at Distilled. And it's just a funny culmination of events, full circle. But that being said, um, I worked at multiple brands, high level on strategy. So global marketing strategy and understanding, you know, what our I would say mission is and what our slogans are, just old school marketing, billboards, print, and then never went into performance marketing because at the time e-commerce was budding, but it wasn't as hard hitting as it is now. When I was doing that, as much as I loved it, I just didn't see data and metrics as a complete result from my efforts at that time. And it was bugging me. So I ended up going uh, into an agency, fresh doe-eyed, had all this experience with different brands like Disney, Supra, uh, Modelo, all of them, and came in and I was like, okay, I'm going entry level into an agency for paid media, specifically paid social. I was the runt and I went in there and I fell in love and I dove in so hard to the point where I pushed everyone out and I became the director of that uh, portion of the business and then grew it about uh, 80%, which was huge, and then built their organic social market and then also decided, okay, now that we've scaled, we're on top of the world. Well, it was a rude awakening because iOS 14 hit and I lost 40% of my book of business and I was scrambling and I was like, shit, what are we going to do? So I started looking at different platforms because I learned about first party data. And in doing so, as much as I loved it, I just didn't feel like it was built the right way. I felt like there was a huge gap in the market. There was nothing built for tacticians, the people making the decisions in media. It was great for C-suite. So I selfishly went to my now co-founder and was like, let's just build one. And in doing so, it became a love letter to media buyers, to brands, to agencies of how to actually read data, but then react to it. So fast forward, we built Ad Beacon. Um, I am the black sheep in the community and the only chick in the community when it comes to attribution. Uh, I speak on what it is. I want to educate. Ad Beacon is basically a solution for agencies and media buyers and brands on how to track post iOS 14. But it's not just that. We really focus on optimization. We focus on making decisions for profitable growth. And uh, that's where we are. Yeah. Everybody on this call is like fairly aware of what attribution is and et cetera. And I'm going to throw out some hot takes. And then I want to tell you guys that I invented an optimization model. So I like to just like dumb it down for anybody who's listening that doesn't understand attribution. We have a lot of acronyms and giant words in marketing, but we don't have a like a simple way of looking at it. So all I always say is just attribution is who gets credit for like a sale or a lead within a given amount of time. And you have to understand your customer's journey by channel, then you're able to scale. And I think we're so inundated in meta where we just see numbers and we just press buttons and we want to react fast because it's like gambling. But the thing is, we don't have a plan. And first party data just unveils so much of that. So there's the concept of view versus click attribution. View attribution is if you saw an ad within a certain amount of time, it gets credit. If you clicked an ad within a certain amount of time, it gets credit. I'm going to hot take this. I'm going to say F view attribution. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm only going to look at click attribution. And the reason why is I can't scale. I can't feel confident without a tangible piece of evidence that this happened to a sale. View attribution is a set of metrics a platform will decide that says, okay, yeah, it helped me, but it does inflate. So if you're ever in meta and you do the breakdown and you look at view versus click, you'll get a rude awakening and it'll be really fun. You can call me later. The idea is like, if you just wanted to look at first click attribution, applicability is like, you'll know that this is a really great discovery channel. So often I see meta is really good at the start, but terrible at the end, right? Like it's really good to find out about a product on meta, but then when you actually purchase, it's usually not meta. It's also usually not Pinterest, but for this example, it is. And last click is going to give the credit to the last touch before the sale. So it ignores everything that happened before and first click ignores everything that happened after. A lot of media buyers only go after last click, but again, you negate 
the entire process beforehand. Um, because what Jack said, like, you know, you could get an ad and then you go to target, right? Who's going to get credit and for how much? A linear attribution is really good in terms of reporting to deduce down by how many clicks there are. So each channel gets credit for the amount of clicks and it all adds up to 100 at the end of the day, which I think is really good in terms of reporting. And then the last one is full impact. In other words, every single click gets 100% credit, which is how Meta basically does it which is why, again, the numbers are so inflated. Like you go into your Shopify and you're like, what the hell is this? This doesn't make sense. The number one question I would get that would make my head bang on a wall is which one of these four are you going to optimize off of? So I guess like high level, which one would you guys choose to optimize? It depends so much on your business, right? Uh, uh, for example, we, we tried many attribution tools and we couldn't work with, with, with any because usually there is a, the halo effect that they calculate, but our business, like the assumption is that Facebook has a halo effect, but in our case, it's Google who has a halo effect, but whatever. The point is that if, if you ask me, I would prefer weighted attribution based on the channels that are actually contributing the most, not just touching. So here is the problem. <clears throat> I own or I co-found and am the CEO of uh, a, an attribution platform, originally an attribution platform. And I sat here and people would ask me this question and my answer would be what Jack said. It depends on your business. But it rubbed me so wrong because I'm like, there's got to be another way. There's got to be something that's simpler. And I agree with everything that you're saying, but I'm going to take it here. So I realize all of these have problems, right? Hyperinflation, too fractionalized, cuts off the whole journey, et cetera. So I created something called a lighthouse model. And basically what it does is it's optimization only. So I realized the ones on the left were great for reporting but not for optimization. The one that I'm deciding on, you guys can tell me I'm full of shit, I'm fine with it, is, hey, if I'm optimizing for meta, I can only control what I can see within this platform. So if all the clicks were here and two of those clicks were meta, I only care about what meta had in that hand of the sale without inflating the revenue or the volume of orders. So in other words, when we look at attribution platforms, we often look at the entire customer journey because we're like so excited now we can see it. But if we did linear on optimization, now you're, you're getting a small fraction of a very long journey usually. And you're optimizing off of it and you're probably screwed and your numbers look terrible. Full impact is the closest to meta, but again, so inflated and it's hard again. It doesn't really help. First click and last click, again, take out the rest of the journey and weighted is really dependent on your business. So instead of looking at the full omni channel, all I can look at is if I'm optimizing meta, what was meta's hand in this customer journey, ignore the other touch points from the other channels and fraction it off just by meta's touch points in it. So a very simple way of looking at this, if there's four clicks, hundred dollar sale, and two clicks were Meta and two clicks were Google and I'm optimizing for Meta, I'm going to ignore Google and I'm going to get $50 for the first touch and $50 for the second touch, whether it be a campaign ad set or ad on the second. So we created this just to optimize, thinking about the one channel with proof. So you're saying, hey, if I'm optimizing my Meta ads, let's ignore what Google could have or didn't do and it's just... Let's only think that Meta is the only channel. Yeah. So in this example right here, in the Lighthouse model, there's one touch Facebook, or sorry, two touches Facebook, one touch Snapchat, Google, Pinterest, and TikTok. If I'm looking at this, all of this is supposed to add up to $100, right? We did this in the linear view. I'm going to ignore Snapchat, Google, Pinterest, and TikTok, and I'm going to divide these two touch points in half right? Because there's only two because I'm optimizing on meta. So yes, to your point. But if I were to optimize on Google, then it would be $100 Google and delete all these other, right? Because it'd be that one campaign and would ignore. But again, if there's multiple touches meta, then it would be divided by three or four, depending on how many clicks, because that was meta's hand in that sale. And that's why we do it this way. Because in meta, when we optimize, meta doesn't give a shit about Google Bing, Pinterest, Snapchat. They don't think of, they just think about their credit. So as media buyers, we've always been media buying this way. 
why would we change that when we introduce an attribution platform? For optimization purposes, I understand it. But then how do you calculate to present it to your to the user of, of your of Adbeacon? Like what's the cost? What's the actual uh, CPA on each of the channels? Because for again, for optimization, you're doing 50 50 fine. But then if I if I ask Adbeacon, hey, what's the CPA on on Facebook? What is it? So we can get CPA versus NCPA. And we're able to do that based upon, and again, remember, I'm not inflating the numbers. If there was only one order and it's $100, it's still only going to equate to $100 in one order. It's not going to inflate or fractionalize. So if I look at this, for example, and I see here in the Lighthouse model, seven you know, day click attribution, I can go by new customers versus returning customers. And then I can deduce down, okay, we still spent the same amount. That's the control. But then now I know how much revenue is coming from new customers. This is my CPA for NCPA without the inflation of, like I was saying, the revenue. But again, if you wanted to look linearly, you can. But like I said, we have models for reporting and models for optimization. So this is kind of my idea of this is a very simplified way of optimizing because I've yet to see anything that makes sense uh, that is standard across the board. Because we have to remember, I'm SaaS. I'm standard, right? Your brand, your custom, I can only do as much as I can to help the greater without hyper customization. So I think the next wave would be, for example, giving you an option to wait based off of your business. That could be interesting too, but this is kind of the middle ground. So this is an interesting, different way of thinking about it. Amazing. That was great. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Really great guests and hope to probably have you guys back. Really enjoyed it, brothers and, and, and lady. I was like, I'm a brother. <laughs> you call yourself daddy, Phoenix. Yeah, or father. You choose. <laughs>